this live. I'll try to keep it short and sweet as much as possible. But this live is a warning to the body of Christ. Um, there are a few things that God wanted me to share with you all. I'm going to do that and then I'm going to hop off. Uh, first of all, my name is Tiffany Montgomery. Uh, I have a ministry that God has gifted me with called Covered by God. It's a prophetic and teaching ministry. It's also a praying and fasting ministry. God birthed that through, through me February 29th, leap year 2020. And uh, we've been rocking and rolling ever since. Um, we fast every single month, the first three days of every single month for a few years now. If you would like to join these fasts, go to coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co. Enter your name, email address, and we'll send you the details for next month's fast. Make sure you check your spam folder because sometimes the emails land there. And we meet corporately together uh, about once a month. And you can find those videos on my YouTube page where I'm not just telling tons of jokes on Instagram. I actually teach the word of God. The office that God has me in, for those of you that don't know, and just a refresher for those of you that, that do, is I'm a prophet of God. Uh, I got saved in my shower August 2015. I had a pretty radical encounter with God that changed the trajectory of my life forever. And uh, really almost like Saul to Paul, I went straight way into ministry. My life was changed pretty radically. Um, when I say that I walk in the office of a prophet, what I'm saying to you is I am not prophetic, right? There's a difference between a prophet and a person who is prophetic. Somebody who's prophetic is limited to comforting, exhorting, and edifying the body. Uh, I think one of the issues we have when we run into real prophets of God, whether they're men or women, is their delivery. And I think that the delivery is an issue for you because you have not been able to discern the difference between a prophet of God and somebody who is prophetic. Um, somebody who is prophetic, again, is limited to exhorting, edifying, and comforting the body of Christ. I do that as well. I comfort, exhort, and edify the body of Christ as well. My job, however, is not limited to that. Uh, I am actually under instruction from God. According to Jeremiah, I want you to grab your Bibles for this. According to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Whenever you get a chance, I want you to study those six things because it will then make the prophet office make a lot more sense. What do I mean by that? The first four things that God told his prophet Jeremiah to do were destructive. They looked bad. They looked like they weren't nice. They looked harsh. They looked very abrasive. And a lot of the times when you are called as a prophet of God to tear down systems and structures and religious traditions and cultures, uh, it looks very destructive and it looks very messy because it's like a demolition, right? Whenever you see you're driving past a construction site and they're demolishing something, it looks very, very, very bad. It looks very bad. Um, and then the last two things called, God called that prophet to do was to build and then to plant. So out of the six things, four of the things were very destructive and two of the things were edifying and comforting and all exhorting like, okay? So that's number one. That's what you should know about me is that I'm not just, I'm not, a, I'm not prophetic. I am a prophet of God. And uh, my job is a little different uh, per my instruction from God. Okay, I hope we have that clear. Uh, I also have another job from God, and that is to be a watchman to the body of Christ. If you want to study more on what a watchman is, many of you are called to be watchmen and you are off your high tower. You can go to Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. It gives you the role and responsibility of what a watchman is supposed to do. Um, one of the reasons why the body of Christ is in the amount of trouble that she's in is because the watchmen are not on their walls. Now, if you want to watch movies on Watchmen, my favorite movies to watch are like your Braveheart movies or your Gladiator movies, because these are medieval movies that really show the true definition of a Watchmen. These are the people that sit on the high tower day and night, and they're able to see because of their positioning 
they're able to see further out than somebody on the ground is able to see. We all have different roles and responsibilities in the body of Christ, but these watchmen are called to be higher than everybody else so that they can see impending danger. So what is my job as a watchman? I stand and I see not just pending danger, but I also watch over the harvest, right? I'm also here to watch over the harvest. And the reason why watchmen keep watch over the harvest is because whenever there's a beautiful harvest taking place, you have birds, you have wolves, and you have all other types of animals that come to destroy that harvest. A lot of the times, again, when you are not on the high tower and you're on the ground, you are at a disadvantage because you cannot see everything. You have blind spots all around you, but we do have people that are on the high tower that can see further than you can see. And again, one of our job is not just to see impending danger coming, which we see before everybody else, but one of our jobs is to protect the harvest from birds, wolves, and any other animal that is coming to destroy the harvest. We also have watchmen also have a supernatural ability on the high tower to create a strategy against the enemy for the purpose of God's kingdom advancing. So we all have a job here. We pray that prayer, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means that we all, or watchmen have a responsibility to make sure that God's kingdom is advancing on this earth as it already is scheduled in heaven. That is our job. Again, if you want to know more about the duty of a watchman, please go to Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. I also operate very strongly in uh, one of the nine gifts of the spirit, which is the gift of discerning of spirits. Now, like many of you, when I first learned about my gift of discerning of spirits, I operated in it with a lot of no wisdom, right? And that is when you don't have language for what this gift is, but you get around somebody and you just know they're not right. And because you don't know how to handle that, you, especially if you are a fighter like I used to be, then you like, yeah, I don't even like you get away from me. Like, or you just fight them, which is what I used to do when I was in the world because I had that gift. It was very, very, very apparent on me. Um, let me give you an example. And it's just a quick example. Just a few days ago, I was at my financial advisor's office. I don't have to go there often, but I did have to go a few days ago to sign something. And um, I've known her for years. So we sat and chatted. And at the end of it, I had to go into just right next, the next door down to meet with the other person to give them my bank account password so that they could do the thing that they needed to do. Um, when I went in there, she said, Tiffany, have you ever met Let's call her Becky. No, 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 we don't want to call her Becky. Becky I use for another lady. Let's call her Jan. She said, Tiffany, have you ever met Jan? And I go, no, Jan, it's so nice to meet you. I've never met you. And I go, where's the other girl that used to do this work? And she's like, oh, well, you know, she, we, she's just working somewhere else now. And the very first thing I said was, I'm glad you let her go. I didn't like her. I didn't trust her. Something was wrong with her. I couldn't put my finger on it. I said, remember you used to ask me very personal questions around her and I literally would not answer you. Now I need you to understand what I just said. I didn't trust this girl. I had no, I had no, I had no, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? I didn't have any proof that something was wrong with her. Uh, I just knew every time I got around her, I was vexed. She gave me her best smile every time. She was always uh, nice to me, but something about her vexed me. So anytime my advisor would ask me a personal questions because her and I know each other, I would never, I would stop talking and just look back at the computer. Now to the naked eye, because a lot of you judge me by your naked eye, you would look at me and say, Tiffany is being rude. Tiffany is being disrespectful. Tiffany is being abrasive. Even though she didn't say anything, spiritually, she's just being abrasive. Tiffany is not a nice person. I want you to get this. If you all, which most of you do, judge me by appearance, that's what you would have judged me as when this lady was, when I just would ignore her. I wouldn't ask her, I wouldn't even answer her. I was, I was literally, I didn't even say no thank you. I didn't lie and move the conversation somewhere else. I stopped talking. You gotta understand what that looks like for me. I also reminded her and I said, remember when you wanted me to take the two verification off my account because they may text me one day, it may take me six days for them for me to text them back. And a lot of the times they need the information right away. And I said, I didn't do that because I didn't trust this girl. Now, mind you, I'm saying all of this without knowing why they had let her go. 
She then goes on to tell me that this girl was found embezzling money from clients. She couldn't get into mine because I had a two-step verification that I wouldn't take off. She was embezzling money from clients and they're currently indicting her to the fullest extent of the law. What am I trying to say? I have a gift of discerning of spirits that even if I didn't have proof, because that's what the gift is for, by the time you see proof, you're probably in too late and you're going to you're going to feel the punishment of waiting until you have proof. I didn't need proof because I knew something wasn't right. And even if I couldn't put my finger on it, I still protected myself as if I believed the Holy Ghost was telling me the truth. What's another example? Because I have a hundred of them, but I'm only going to give you one more. Years ago, um, there was a, a woman that was working with a publicist. And every time this publicist came around me, I mean, this publicist was super helpful for the company. She was a star employee. Like there, she, everybody loved this lady except for me. She would come around. I would say something. Matter of fact, my personality just shuts down because I don't know how to be two-faced. I don't know how to smile in your face. That's what makes me a gem really to be your friend because I'm not two-faced. You would never have to wonder if I like you or not. And the lady asked uh, the boss, she said, Tiffany doesn't like me. And she was like, Tiffany, you don't like her? I said, no, not at all. Something's not right with her. I think you should fire her, get rid of her. Something ain't right. I don't trust her. I don't like her around me. I don't like her. And I'm gonna punch her in her face. Now, I wasn't really all that saved, but you know, I was doing the best I could. And she said, well, Tiffany, I can't fire her because she's never done anything. And she's like literally the best person we've ever had working, which is what my advisor said about the woman that they found embezzling. She said that she was almost one of the best employees she had. This person said the same thing to me. She's one of the best employees she has. She's like, I have no proof. And I said, that's fine. I don't trust her and I don't want her working on none of my stuff. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from the boss. Um, this woman had stole $50,000 out of her bank account. And she also stole something out of her. Um, she stole something from her that she had to take her to court to get. And so what is a common denominator of these two stories? Because I have a hundred more where those came from, but I'll stop there. The common denominator is number one, I sent something about people that I couldn't put my finger on. Um, and I had learned through uh, my tutelage with the Holy Spirit not to wait until I had proof to act on what God was showing me. Number two, I learned that these two people kept these people around because they loved them. And what I've learned over time is that your love for somebody will dim your spiritual discernment about those people. What is discernment? Discernment is different. I'm sorry, the gift of discerning of spirits, which is one of the nine gifts of the spirit, is much different from discernment. Discernment is your ability to tell the difference between right and wrong. The gift of discerning of spirits is the ability to tell the spirit operating behind the person with a smile on their face. Um, but this doesn't work with just finding bad about people. It also works with finding good about people. What do I mean by that? Well, obviously, I gave two examples of how I use the gift of discerning of spirits to uh, smoke out a snake when nobody else could see it. But there are those times where you have people that nobody likes Everybody hates, everybody's saying something ain't right about that person. And the spirit of God inside of you is saying, nope, get your mouth off that one. That one belongs to me. You keep your mouth off that one. So if that happens to you, which a lot of you find that out with me, you guys hate my guts until you go to God about me. And then he's like, leave her alone. You find that that is the gift of discerning of spirits in operation. So I'll say it again. I am a prophet of God. I am not prophetic. Um, I don't, I am not limited to exhorting, edifying, and comforting the body of Christ. Uh, my job is to pull down, root out, throw down, destroy, and to build and to plant. Half of my job is very destructive for the body of Christ. I'm also a watchman to the body of Christ, and I am called to warn you of impending danger. I am also called to watch over the harvest from birds and wolves and other animals that come to destroy the harvest. Um, and I'm also called to put together supernatural strategies so that God's kingdom can advance on earth as it already is in heaven. One of the strongest gifts that I have in the body is the gift of discerning of spirits. And so how was I trained by God? Let's talk about that for about 30 seconds. Number one, um, God trained me back in 2020. And many of you remember a few lives I did because I taught my training with you was John 7, 24. He told me, Tiffany, don't judge anything according to appearance, but judge according to righteous judgment. Now, I, like many of you, did my fair share of assuming on people. I also, like many of you, 
had my suspicions on people, right? And so a lot of the times when you operate with a gift of discerning of spirits, if this gift is not crucified on the cross and not cleansed by God, you will then walk into suspicion, you then walk into assumptions, and you get in trouble with God. Now, you may say, well, Tiffany, how did God begin to train you on this back in 2020? And I'm telling you, I was under strict instructions with God. Don't you assume nothing no more. I remember I was on Facebook one day and I saw um, a news thing on Facebook that a wife was murdered by her pastor husband in the church parking lot. And I remember going to the Facebook page because I wanted to know more about the church and what the heck happened and how this pastor killed this lady. And I saw on a flyer that they called them Lady Elects. So I said to myself, oh, they're full of the spirit of religion. And this is why none of them caught this in the realm of the spirit because they full of religion. The Holy Ghost ain't even there because Lady Elect, they just making up titles now. Right. This is what I say out loud. Later on that night, there was a, I read books, but there was a book in my room. This book had to have been only 50 pages long. It was a physical book. It's 50 pages long. And I was like, you know, I can get this book done in a night. It was about women in ministry. And sure enough, I, I didn't even start at page one, you guys. I started at page maybe 28. And the page that I opened it up to not only had a whole chapter on Lady Elect, it also had the scripture where Lady Elect was in the Bible. That is when God began to take me on a journey. And um, God began to take me on a journey of judging not by appearance, but according to righteous judgment. What does God mean by that? Right. When God says, don't judge anything, y'all, by appearance, which means, so what does judge mean? I looked it up in the Greek definition. The word judge means do not separate. So I'm going to say it in the sentence. Judge not according to appearance. Or in other words, don't separate from somebody according to what they look like. It also means don't approve of nobody just because of what they look like. It also means don't esteem anybody just because of what they look like or what you hear about them or how much you like them in their messages. It also means don't have an opinion of somebody because of what they look like and how good their messages are and how great their Instagram profile is and how, don't do that. Don't, don't determine anything about what you hear about these fights on social media. Don't make a determination based off of who your favorite one fighting is in this moment. Don't pronounce an opinion concerning right or wrong. These are all the Greek definitions, y'all. I'm not making this up. Judge means don't pronounce an opinion concerning right or wrong based off of what this looks like on social media. It also means to contend together. Don't contend together according to the appearance of things. And it also means don't condemn. Judge not according to appearance, but judge, separate yourself from this person or approve of this person or esteem of this person, or now you can have an opinion of what's right or what's wrong. Now you can contend together or condemned because of righteous judgment. What is righteous judgment? The word righteous means virtuous. The word righteous means keeping the commands of God, which you can only keep if you study scripture. The word righteous also means one whose way of thinking, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to the will of God. That's what righteous means. A person whose way of thinking, whose way of feeling, whose way of acting is wholly conformed to the will of God. I want you to ask yourselves right now, because many of you say that's you, but it's not you if you don't study your word. If you have a devotional and you read that every day, that's still not you because you are not one that studies the word of God. And so we want to be very careful about that, that I would fair to say 90% of the people watching this right now is judging according to appearance and no one is judging according to righteous judgment. God also trained me on how to be very slow to speak on situations even when I know that I'm right. What does that look like? Many of you know that I had a run-in with a very perverted church in Chicago, Illinois back in 2017. I was a part of that organization for five months. I left um, after I saw some very perverted things and I did not speak publicly about that until 2019, okay? I did not speak out publicly about it until 2019. What does that mean? That means that God was training me, even in that moment, to be slow to speak in a situation that I knew I was right in. 
I'll never forget that the um, that the person that was a pastor there, um, just because I just don't want to even disrespect the office to call him a pastor, uh, but the um, the one that called himself an apostle that was there said out loud on a video, if this is not, he called me a witch um, publicly. And he said, if this is not true, she will outlive the lie. Well, you guys, that was in 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, six years later, I have outlived that lie a million times over. This live today is about uh, false prophets. And as of last week and a few times this week, I've had several people come in my inbox saying, Tiffany, you should be careful about calling out false prophets because they call you a false prophet and a witch. So because they call you a false prophet and a witch, you shouldn't speak out against them. Number one, God had already warned me about the series of false accusations via YouTube um, that would come against me as a retaliation of my assignment to expose and reprove. I ain't scared of none of y'all. It's an intimidation tactic and it's emotional manipulation. And the goal is to weaken my influence. I want you all to know that I fought uh, about 17,000 churches back in 2017 and uh, I was the one that won. And so you have to forgive me for not being afraid of any of you. Um, I do this for one applause, for the applause of one. And as long as all of heaven is backing me, that's all that matters. Uh, I would also like to say this, your dislike for me and your dislike for my delivery does not make or does not qualify me to be a false prophet. Just because you don't like me, just because you don't like how I say things, just because you think I'm rude and, ab and, uh, and abrasive, does not qualify me to be a false prophet. I have seen a few of the YouTube videos about me. Um, and I even heard one lady say she's up there with those fake nails and that fake hair. Obviously I have a bob now, but I, I don't wear weave guys. My hair was literally almost waist length. It was my hair and my nails were also real. So these people are just literally delusional and just very clownish to be very honest with you. Um, there's a lot of videos on YouTube telling me to repent um, and, uh, I live a lifestyle of repentance. And so, um, you all are led to discern that yourself and, uh, anybody that believes them is just stupid. Now let's go to why I'm here. Um, over the last few days, we've seen, uh, an uproar on social media about false prophets. And, uh, I was watching the believers responses to this. Now, obviously, for those of you that don't know, I am the prophet that spoke against Christians going to Bell Yonsei's concert. Um, what I said was the concert is a, is a portal and it's a gate. What we have found out since is that one of the set designers posted on Instagram the sketchings of the concert. And in one of those sketchings, they literally write on top of it, the portal. Um, and so I am that person. I had a lot of your favorite worshipers, a lot of your favorite singers, a lot of your favorite motivational pastors speak publicly against me for telling Christians not to go to this initiation, this ritualistic initiation. Uh, and so I have been very concerned, obviously, at the response of the body of Christ. And, uh, and I've wanted to know more about it. So when I watched what was going on, um, over the last few days in the conversation, I asked God why believers had certain responses to this, right? Why do believers protect false prophets? And I'm going to give you the revelation that God has given me. I posted it on my Facebook page. I'm going to read it out loud. But this is the revelation that God gives me. He, I said, you, do you want to know the revelation that God gave me about false prophets who have infiltrated the body of Christ and the believers who hate you when you expose and call their favorites out? This is what I heard the, the spirit of the living God say. I heard God say, daughter, false prophets are likened unto child molesters. They do their best damage when the believer is young, not in age, but in word, in prayer, in relationship, and in intimacy with him. These false prophets build trust. They've been grooming the body of Christ for years while nobody was watching and they appear suddenly by the time they have, by this time they have many victims, most who have fallen in love with the predator. The ones who want to speak out cannot. They've been conditioned to fear, 
fear on what happens when they warn, when their warning falls on deaf ears, fear of not wanting to embarrass the other victims by telling their stories, fear on what happens when they're, when they're attacked even more. The false prophets, AKA the child molesters, they have power. Um, they have influence. They're well liked. They can give you prophetic words. They can tell you your address, your bank account, what color your daddy had on when he died. And the victims, they're unheard of, they're muzzled, they're silenced, and they're a nobody. But you have other leaders, you have other people, leaders specifically in the body of Christ, who see these false prophets molesting God's body. And they stay quiet, protecting them even, just like they've done in their childhood homes, which is why the family molester or rapist is still roaming free to pick another victim for another day. God told me that what I was seeing is what has happened in the homes of people secretly for generations. A child gets molested or raped. The molester grooms them into secrecy, intimidation, and fear. The child either speaks out and gets reprimanded and told that they're lying, or they just keep quiet. Very few grow up to have the boldness to warn and save the others. It's been beat out of them. These are your more passive and scared Christians. The issue is most people know the predator because they've been a victim of that person. This is what's happening now on social media. The false prophets are on the rise. People are warning the body of Christ that these are predators and the body of believers are acting as the parents who don't believe their own while reprimanding or beating the boldness out of them. They call them. Remember when you saw a little girl at nine years old and you said that girl is just fast. No, she wasn't fast. She was raped and you turned a blind eye to it because you didn't have the gift of discerning of spirits. So you call them fast. You say things like, well, what was you doing to deserve it? You shouldn't have, you, you shouldn't have had that on. Blaming everybody except for the actual molester. The spirit of God told me personally to give a warning to the body of Christ to protect his sheep against these false prophets. Their assignment is no light thing to the body. They come to tear apart the life of the child so that when they get older, they have all types of perversion and identity issues. This is when you see so many gay, flamboyant, effeminate, or if you're a woman, super masculine, pastors, prophets, etc., now infiltrating the body of Christ. Not all, but the vast majority of these people were molested as children and that spirit has followed them into adulthood. They are same sex attracted and have perverted the pulpit of God by preaching one minute and pumping their penis into the hole of a man the next. That's why the body of Christ is in so much need of correction, healing, and restoration now, because this is what they're doing to new believers, the babes in Christ. We have all been praying for revival. We've been singing about revival. We've been posting about revival. Wouldn't it be a shame, wouldn't it be a shame to watch this revival we begged God for fall into the hands of the false prophets, or in other words, the molesters of the body of Christ. Yeah, it would be a shame. I know many of you get your panties in a bunch when people expose false prophets, but maybe if you knew that God Almighty considers them molesters to the body, you wouldn't be so offended. I've experienced your hate back in 2019 when I exposed. I know how vile and blinded believers can be, but according to God, I stopped thousands upon thousands of babies in the body from falling victim to who God himself considered dangerous. I know no child molester that willingly confesses to abusing children. They usually lie over and over and over again. I know no false prophet that willingly confesses to being a false prophet. They usually lie over and over and over again. They even threaten. I've been saying for a while now that there will be a showdown between the prophets of God and the prophets of Baal. And my question has always been, who is on the Lord's side. Don't say me in my comments if you're against God's prophet doing their actual God-given job. Y'all say believers need to stop fighting each other. People are watching. Y'all who are saying that are just as detrimental as the older generation that swept the violation of these children in their bloodline under the carpet. This is not a Christian versus Christian conversation. This is a prophet of God versus prophet of Baal conversation. And I will ask you one more time, who is on the Lord's side. I ended by saying I was prompted to share this by God. May this bring repentance for being tolerant of these predators and not protecting the body of Christ because you feel like it should be done a certain way. God told me to tell you that your feelings are a liar and will lead you to hell. Now, I mentioned that one of my job as a watchman was to watch over the harvest from birds and wolves. 
And uh, the, pro the false prophets are here to reap uh, the harvest that we've been praying about. Now, one thing I want to bring into your remembrance is what a child molester does to a child. We often talk about impartations in a godly way, but there is a demonic impartation that happens when a child is violated at a young age. When a person sexually violates a child at a young age, that child has sexual perversion now in their spirit. They turn out to be, not all, but most, homosexuals, lesbians, effeminate, super um, promiscuous, right? Even if you're not same-sex attracted, you end up being promiscuous. You have addictions to pornography and, and uh, master excuse me, masturbation, right? That is the goal. The goal is for you to get older and now struggle in your relationships or really struggle in your marriage because of this demon, right? The truth is, you guys, we never protected them as children. And now you're seeing a people protecting a lifestyle that they're bound to, a lifestyle that was birthed in violation. One thing about the homosexual or the LGBTQ community is that they are graced to build community. They are graced to come together and build community. There's nowhere like the American church you will see the amount of homosexuality and lesbianism that have built hives of community in our churches. And nobody says anything because I don't know why y'all not saying nothing. But if God considers false prophets, child molesters to his body, then what is the goal of the child molester? I want you to first understand that they are coming after babes and you being 50 years old does not exempt you from being a babe. If for 30 years you have been in a church, but you have only ever gone off of the word of your pastor and you have not been a Berean, which is studying the word of God for yourself. The babes are not in age, but they are in your, your prayer life. You can be a babe in your prayer life, a babe in your study life, a babe in your worship life, a babe in your intimacy with God. Now, what is the goal of this? Just like in a physical child molestation, the goal was sexual perversion, turn you into homosexual, lesbian, promiscuity, you know, pornography, masturbation, all of that. It's literally designed to ruin your life. Well, spiritually, it's designed for spiritual perversion. It's designed for witchcraft to infiltrate the church, just like the LGBTQ community has infiltrated the church is designed for witchcraft to do the same thing that you see that community do in our church. And it's designed for us to have mixture without questioning it. The biggest goal is to groom us for the antichrist that's coming. I will say this, anybody that is teaching third eye astral projection, that is teaching on the frontlets and levitation, is teaching doctrines of demons, and you are operating in witchcraft. These people should be marked as dangerous in the body of Christ, not because I don't like them, but because God says so. Their goal is to lead God's sheep astray. That is their number one goal. I'm gonna say that again. Anybody that is teaching third eye astral projection, there, anybody teaching on frontlets or levitation is teaching doctrines of demons and is operating in witchcraft. These people should be marked. And their goal is to lead God's sheep astray. But I'm gonna go one step further and I'm gonna say to you, anybody that is endorsing, publicly defending and protecting anybody who is teaching third eye, astral projection, frontlets and levitation, owes God's sheep a public explanation of why it is still okay to minister with these people when Ephesians 5.11 makes it clear, have no fellowship, or in other words, do not even communicate with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, correct them, rebuke them. That's what that means. That means that if your favorite prophet, if your favorite pastor, if your favorite apostle, if your favorite social media influencer has joined forces with anybody that is doing these things, they owe the body of Christ a public explanation of why it is all of a sudden okay to now work together 
with the work of darkness because that's what's happening. Now, let me say this very quickly. I don't want to go here yet. I'll wait for a second. I'll go there in a second. I was reading a book the other day. It was a Christian book on the power of our words, the power of our prayer life. And the book said, this was a Christian book, but it gave an Al Capone example. I thought it was powerful. The book says, if they, kicked, if they had kicked Al Capone out of Chicago when he was just a small time operator, he would not have been so hard to handle. But they waited until he became a first class criminal with his forces built up around him. Then it took an army to take him down. This is not a conversation about Christians versus Christians. This is a conversation about the prophets of God versus the prophets of Baal. Now, I want to give you some example because some of the backlash I've been getting in my comments is, Tiffany, why don't you go to these people um, in private and square it out? And I want to say this again. This is not a conversation about Christian versus Christian. This is a conversation about the prophets of God versus the prophets of Baal. Now, if this were a conversation about Christians versus Christians, because let me give you an example. There is a couple on social media. They are very well known. I would fair to say 95% of you know this couple. Well, um, they have a cousin that went to the organization I went to in 2017. And that cousin told them that she had a dream of me preaching on stage. And there were some snakes that were following me as I was preaching. This couple then went out of the country with another group of people. My name was brought up at that table. They said, what do you think about Tiffany? And they say, she's a false prophet. Here's why. Our cousin that went to this church that she went to said that they, say they saw her ministering with snakes following her and she's a false prophet. I know that, right? Obviously, I know that they're wrong. What is my point? Just because they lied on me, does not, that does not make them false prophets, okay? I want you to be very clear. Just because they lie, or I want, you, I want you to be clear on my stance. Just because they lied on me does not make them a false prophet, right? I just, God made sure I'm privy to a lot of information. It came back to me. I still think they're Christians. I just believe they have no discernment. And I believe that they operate in a spirit of error. But I do not believe that they are false prophets, right? What do you do when it's a Christian versus a Christian? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17 says, if your brother trespasses against you, go and tell him his fault between you alone. And if he hears you, you've gained a brother. Verse 16, but if he won't hear you, take one or two more that in the mouth for two or three witnesses, every word is established. And verse 17 says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be seen as a heathen man and as a publican. We also know how God tells us to handle this. If this was brother versus brother in Colossians chapter three, verse 13, where it says forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What did I do in that situation? I forgave, even though I don't like them because I was not called to like you. If you're lying on me and you're bearing a false witness against me, I do not like you, but I forgave. And I don't deem you a false prophet. I just deem you in error and blind as a bad in the realm of the spirit. But the scripture tells me if it's brother to brother, you forgive, right? Then I'm going to take you over to the second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 15. The Bible says, count, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So the people that lied on me is not my enemy. We both work for the same employer, God. We are both on the same team, God's team. You don't have to like somebody to stand shoulder to shoulder to fight the enemy who is the kingdom of darkness. But the issue here is we are coming after prophets of God versus prophets of Baal. Whenever you have somebody that is teaching witchcraft, they are no, no longer, they're not a brother in Christ. They're not a sister in Christ. These are false prophets, false apostles, false teachers. They are false ministers of the gospels. They are operating out of seducing spirits. They are teaching you doctrines of demons. And scripture is clear on how he wants us to handle it. Let's go to Colossians chapter one, verse 28, where it says, 
We preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So God gives us our standard of what we were supposed to be doing. We're all supposed to be preaching. We're all supposed to be warning and we're all supposed to be teaching in wisdom. Okay. I'm also going to take you to second Thessalonians chapter back to chapter three, verse six, which says, now we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he has received from us. So we have command here to withdraw ourselves from anybody who is not walking according to the word of God. Um, the word uh, withdraw means to avoid them. It means to abstain from associating with them. That's what it means. Just so we're clear. And of course, we have Ephesians 5.11, which I've already read, which says, have no fellowship, or in other words, have no communication. Have no communication with the unfruitful works of darkness. Anybody teaching you third eye, astral projection, frontlets and levitation is teaching you pure witchcraft. I mean, pure witchcraft. This is what witches and warlocks do. This is pure witchcraft. This is not a conversation, you guys, of somebody who's just ignorant. Here's the issue with this. Even if it's somebody you love that is teaching this in error, you still have a responsibility to the body of Christ to sit them down, disassociate yourself with them publicly for the sake of not letting God's sheep go astray, even if you still love them in private and you're witnessing with them in private and you're counseling them in private and they have a moral responsibility to publicly come before the body of Christ and denounce the teaching of third eye, astral projection, frontlet and levitation. That is the order of it. We have in scripture, Eli, who had two perverted sons, Hopney and Phineas. These sons were sexually immoral, having sex with everybody in the church and stealing money. The Bible tells us that Eli rebuked his sons. So many of us look and say, well, they rebuked him. What are we supposed to do? The reason why Eli died is because he was responsible for protecting God's sheep and not protecting the leader. He was, and he did not do right by just rebuking them, knowing that they were still doing that. He lost his life because of that. His job was to take them off of that position. I too had to practice what I preached at Cover by God. I've had uh, one person that was working closely with me at Cover by God. And every time I turned around, this guy was giving a woman a ride home. And I was like, well, he putting, he gonna, he's going to be putting his, his dick in her soon, God. So I had to tell him, hey, I got to let you go, buddy. You can't do this here. What are you doing? You know what I'm saying? So you have a response. My responsibility was not to protect this person because I've known this person longer than I've known any of you. My job was to protect God's sheep because God will hold me accountable for knowing that a predator was in the midst of the women there and I allowed him um, to have his way with them. God is waging a war against your opinions. Now, many of you have responded to me in my comments from the book of opinions, chapter 18, verse 43. And God is not looking for your opinions, which will easily also turn into the doctrine of demons. If you call yourself a blood-bought believer of Jesus Christ, your responsibility is to make the word of God your first and final authority. Your job is to make scripture um, the answer, period, whether you agree or disagree. There's a lot of things I disagree with and don't agree with or don't understand with scripture. But the Bible says in Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man be a liar, which means that my feelings are a liar if they go up against the word of God. It means that your feelings are a liar if they go up against the word of God. God is waging a war in this hour against your opinion and against anybody in the body of Christ that is fighting on social media based off of opinion and not giving scripture to back up your stance. Because what you're doing publicly is you're leading God's sheep astray and God is calling judgment on what's going on in this hour. Now, the last generation that we have, God bless them. We love our last generation. And I will say some of them, not all, um, did us a disservice. They did not know the word of God. 
They were in church 50 years and they only went off of what their pastor said. And so now we have a generation of believers my age that are saying things like, well, my grandma said, girl, your grandma is a liar if she goes up against the word of God too. Nana is a liar. Big mama is a liar. I know you like her a lot, but there should be no human being that you exalt over the word of God. I need you to hear me on this. I don't care how much you love your pastor currently. I don't care how much you idolatry your pastor. I don't care how much you think your pastor can do no wrong. If you find scripture and it's going against what they've been teaching you guys, the scripture is where you stop at as your proof that the pastor is wrong. I'm telling you now, God is coming after our idols and we want to make sure that you're not leaving these people to become idols to you. Our last generation did us a disservice and many of you are going off of what your grandma said, your daddy said, your mama said, and none of them are going off of the word of God. This will be known as a generation of Bereans. This will be, a, this will be known as a generation of men and women of God of all ages who will put down their plates in praying and fasting to push God's kingdom agenda forward and to tear down these altars that are that are really speaking on behalf of these false prophets and ministers that have gained a lot of a, got, gained a lot of traction here in America. No man or woman is to be exalted above the word of God no matter how much you love them. There are two spirits always in operation in a man. The spirit of truth which only can be given to you by the Holy Ghost and the spirit of error which is given from a whole different spirit. So in this hour, you guys, you are not to be led by your favorite social media influencer, your favorite motivational pastor, your favorite YouTube and Facebook sensation. You are not to be led by Tiffany. In this hour, you are only to be led by the word of God. If I say something that goes up against the word of God, you are no longer able to listen to me. We are in an hour of great delusion. The Bible says, what does the Bible say, Lord? The Bible even says, and for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, what happens if we don't, well, let me just say this. What are the open doors that all of, most of you are falling into? That's why y'all keep falling after these false prophets. Now, again, y'all, have you ever been in a bad relationship that was kind of abusive? If not physically, it was financially abusive, emotionally abusive, mentally abusive, whatever it was, it was just super abusive. You left that relationship. You got into a new relationship and this is like you was dating the same person with a different face and body. Has any of you ever experienced that? Well, the same thing happens in the realm of the spirit, that if you're not careful, if you leave a cult or if you leave a body that was full of spiritual witchcraft, if you have not repented for idolatry and if you have not gone to God and asked God to um, wipe off any residue or any linking in the realm of the spirit that will still attract you to that kind of person or minister, you're going to run into them again. So you have opened doors. This is why you guys are falling for these false prophets on social media right now. You guys have opened doors in your life. And I have three open doors that, are, that I have written down right now. But one of the open doors is your idolatry to prophetic words. Now, some of you may find right now that God is not speaking to you or that's what your assumption is. You say things like, Tiffany, God was speaking to me before and I just don't hear him no matter what I do. And I would fair to say that that is not a demonic attack. That is God in his mercy, because here's the thing. There comes a time where God knows that you are. There comes a time where God knows that you are after a prophetic word because you're just gripping in the dark for somebody to tell you what's going on in your life. God needs to shut down all the words so that you go back to scripture because he can't afford for you to be led astray by a false prophet. The Bible lets us know in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse four, let me just go to it because I want to make sure that I'm accurate in the scripture that I'm giving you. And let me say this. Many of you have an issue with me going to um, the Old Testament. Many of you like to say things that the Old Testament does not apply. But let me say this, you guys, you cannot pick and choose what parts of the Bible you like to believe and not believe. If the Old Testament does not apply, then stop quoting Psalms 91. If the Old Testament doesn't apply, stop quoting Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. If uh, the Old Testament doesn't apply, stop saying he was wounded for my transgression and bruised for my iniquities and chastisement of my peace was upon us and with his stripes we were healed. 
if the Old Testament doesn't apply, stop declaring over your life, you will live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. You know, you got to be careful about picking and choosing what parts of the Old Testament you want to go off of and disregarding the rest. But Ezekiel chapter 14, verse four says, therefore speak unto them. No, he says, let's start in three. Ezekiel 14, three. I hope you guys aren't taking my word for it with this scripture. What if I'm lying to you? I hope every one of you has your Bible out right now, double checking if I am telling you the truth. What if I am lying to you? Ezekiel 14 verses three through four says, son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart. You who are looking over a, for a prophetic word all the time. And I put a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I, should I be inquired of at all by them? Verse four says, therefore speak unto them. He's telling the prophet to tell them. Thus saith the Lord, every man of the house of Israel that sets up idols in his heart and puts a stumbling block of iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him according to the multitude of his idols. What is God saying here? He's saying, if you already have idols in your heart and you have a stumbling block before you and you go to a prophet and you say, what's, the, what's thus saith the Lord concerning my life? And you already have this in your heart. The Bible says, I, the Lord, will answer that person that cometh to the prophet according to the multitude of his idols. Okay? So that's, what, that's number one. That's one thing that you have um, an open door because of your idolatry to prophetic words. The other open door that you have is no study life. You do not study the word of God. You have become addicted to YouTubes. Um, you have become addicted to YouTube prophetic words to Facebook prophets, and these people were not sent by God. These people were not sent by God, y'all. And you have no scripture to back up anything that's going on in the world right now. That is an open door to being attacked by these people. And number three, you have no lifestyle of repentance. Now, you may say, Tiffany, what's the big deal, right? Why are you fighting so hard for all of this? And if you take nothing else I say, I need you to hear me very clearly because this is a warning from God. There is something on this earth that is pending. It's bad. It's bad. But history, the Bible lets us know that history has always been shaped by prayer and fasting. Right? If the body of Christ allows these false prophets to infiltrate the church and succeed with their goal of allowing witchcraft to become mixed in with the word of God, with the goal of grooming for the antichrist spirit, let me let you know what's going to happen if we don't fight. There's a story in the Bible of the book of Joshua, a man named Joshua. When Moses died, God put Joshua in charge. God tells Joshua, I'm, I got your back. I got your back your sides and both your fronts. Can nobody touch you? Nobody's ever in life going to hurt you. Anywhere you fight, baby, I'm taking them down. Okay. I got your back. Well, Joshua's first assignment was, what was it? Lord, I just, uh, the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho were impenetrable. Scientists say, genealogists say, these walls could not be broken down. And yet God gave them a strategy to go around this thing, this wall, and on the last day shout, and the shout of the people made this wall come crashing down. But he had one caveat. He said, I will be with you wherever you go. I just have one rule. Don't take anything from these places. Don't take nothing where you're going. The, the children of Israel are not to take anything from this land when you won, right? If you do that, every battle you fight, you're going to win automatically, okay? They win. The next battle they're going to fight is at a place called AI. Because of the guaranteed victory from God and the easy win at the walls of Jericho, Joshua says, I'm going to fight AI, but I don't need as many men this time because God has guaranteed my victory. Joshua was in right standing with God. Joshua and his people were saved. They, were, they did everything right. And here they come to AI with less people because they were guaranteed the victory and they all get murdered. They, they're dead. They get pummeled. Of course, Joshua goes into sackcloths and ashes 
and fasting, crying to God saying, what in the world happened? Why did this? Did you lie to me? What did I do wrong? I did everything you asked me to do. Now, I want you to hear this story from the perspective of something bad is getting ready to happen to this nation. Something bad is on the horizon. Many of you will be saying, Tiffany, we've been praying and fasting. We've been um, breaking evil covenants. We've been tearing down evil altars. We have been, man, really warring over God's bride. We've been doing everything right. How did this thing, how was this thing able to infiltrate this nation and literally arrest it so aggressively? What did we do wrong, God? God tells Joshua, get, get up, stupid, get up, stand up. I told you not to take nothing from this place. And because you took something from this place, you were accursed. And he said, what did I take from this place? I didn't take anything. He said, go ask your men. Somebody took something. He goes and asks his men and he finds out that a man named Akon went and took some of the jewels from Jericho. And because of that, it made the entire team, children of Israel, accursed. They had to end up, you know, getting rid of him, getting rid of the accursed thing. And God was with them again. I say that to say these false prophets are the accursed thing. The Bible says if anybody come to you and preaches a different doctrine than the one we have preached, they are accursed. That is in the new covenant. That is in the new Testament. If anybody come to you and preaches a different doctrine than what we have preached, these people are accursed. If we as the body don't come together and do what we can to rid the body of these child molesters, because what is the, it's the body of Christ and God deems these false prophets molesters to the body. Well, guys, when this thing hits the earth, we're going to be looking around like, how did it infiltrate? What did we do wrong? And it's because the blood was on our hands. So anytime you look at somebody like me saying, why won't she just leave this issue alone? Why is she doing the most? Because the blood won't, won't be on my hands. You understand? The blood is not on my hands. My hands are clean. My job was to warn the body of Christ. These false prophets are gaining a lot of traction in America. They are not prophets of God. They do not get their information from the Holy Spirit. They have delved into the dark arts. You can never say that you were not warned of this message. You are now held accountable for the information that you know. And your lack of knowledge of scripture will not save you from the judgment that's coming. The Bible says my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. That means that what you don't know does not absolve you of the responsibility of having knowing. This is a warning to the leaders of the body of Christ. If you don't begin to protect God's sheep from these molesters in the body of Christ, I heard the Lord say the blood is on your hands and you will reap the harvest of this. The Bible says in the book of Mark, chapter nine, verses 42 through 43. Mark chapter nine, verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, whosoever shall molest one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for you to kill yourself. That's what that scripture says. I know you guys like to think that God is love and he is, but he's also a man of war. I know you like to think of God as the lamb, but he's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, it says here, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he were cast into the sea. That's why I say it's better for you to kill yourself because that's what it is. If you have a millstone around your neck, right? and you're cast into the sea, it's going to take you to the bottom of the sea. It's better for you to die is what he's saying. And if you, and if your hand offends you, cut it off. So basically what he's saying is, is you're held responsible for this. This is new test. This is new. This new Testament. We in, I'm not in the old Testament no more. He said, kill yourself. If you offend one of these little ones to every leader on here, if you find yourself publicly aligning yourself with anybody that has teached 
or his teaching. Third eye, astral projection, frontlets, levitation. You have a responsibility to the body of Christ to publicly explain why God said it was okay for you to partner with people who are knowingly, according to scripture, in witchcraft. You have a responsibility to publicly explain why you are not considered one that is leading God's sheep astray because anytime you publicly minister with these people, you are endorsing them unconsciously. What you're saying is, is this person is a good person. This is why you don't see me endorsing many people because I know that you all trust me and I know that I have a responsibility to God's sheep to make sure that they're not wolves in sheep clothing. There are many people in the body that you once saw me aligned with that you don't see me aligned with anymore because I believe that the spirit of mammon has taken over. I might not believe that they're false prophets, but I also don't believe that they're safe for God's sheep. And so how do you shut down critics? For those of you that are like, Tiffany, I've never been in this position before. You know, these people are going to argue with me. It is very easy to understand how to shut down critics. And all you're going to say is, do you have scripture for that? If you go to my Facebook page, one thing I consistently said over the last few days is, hey, you guys, I don't really want your opinion, but can you give me scripture on how God instructed his prophets to warn the body about people operating in witchcraft? Now, obviously, you have people that gave their opinion. Well, I feel like y'all need to get together and have a conversation and stop all this division in the body of Christ. And you know what I say? Can you give me scripture for that? Can you? I only want scripture for that. I'm not disagreeing with you. Can you give me scripture for it? Because I've seen different scripture that doesn't say that. Can I get scripture for that? Well, I just think, Tiffany, you being messy. Um, can you give me scripture for that? As a prophet of God, me warning God's sheep about witches and warlocks in the body of Christ. Can you give me scripture for that? I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I would just like scripture for that. Can you give me scripture? A lot of people have been telling me, well, don't you dream? I mean, it might not be called third eye, but it's definitely, you know, third eye. And I'm like, can you give me scripture for that? Because I definitely know witches do third eye. And I know as believers, we are to blind any third eye operation that you inherited from your grandparents or down the generations with the blood of Jesus Christ. So can you give me scripture for that? There is nowhere in scripture that says that Saul turning into Paul operated in the third eye. There is nowhere in scripture that says that when the prophet Elijah or Elisha told those people, blinded the people, or he was able to see that there were more for him than there were against him, that he was operating in the third eye. Nowhere in scripture. It is pure witchcraft taught by witches and warlocks in the body of Christ. Again, I have been called a witch before. I do not use that word lightly. These are witches and warlocks in the body of Christ. I have said it before and I will say it again. There is a public showdown that is getting ready to happen. Your idols will fall. I've been saying this since 2022. Somebody in my comments said, well, Tiffany, you must going to be falling too because these people um, idolize you. And I said, nice try, stupid. But I have publicly declared both at my meetings and on social media that if you idolize me, you're going to hell. I have also in my personal life, whenever anybody comes close to me and I sense that they're idolizing me, I no longer talk to them again in life. And so I have a very strong boundary around anybody idolizing me. I actually, in my personal life, will detach from you and never speak to you again. And publicly, I have warned everybody, you will go to hell if you put me on a pedestal. And so I do believe in honor. Um, but I do believe that there's a fine line between honor and idolatry. And I don't believe that the body of Christ has learned that fine line. And I do believe that until leaders begin to live a lifestyle of repentance and they stop wanting the praises of men because they're not getting praise at home and they were picked on in high school, you're always going to deal with leadership in the body of Christ that don't mind people bowing down to them. Your idols will fall. And I've been saying this since 2022. This is a war against the prophets of God and the prophets of Baal. God is raising up whistleblowers in, these, in this hour. These are people in these camps that are going to begin to speak loudly about what is going on without fear of anything. God is raising up prophets who don't care about being threatened um, legally. They could care less about it. They can care less about any threat that's going on. They don't care. These prophets will look like hell sent them. You will have to discern whether this is God or not 
but it will be God. These prophets are ones that will come straight from the street. They didn't fear nobody in the street. They definitely not going to fear these church people. Y'all have picked the wrong ones. You will say to yourself, I should have listened to Tiffany and stopped calling her rude and mean because I would have wished her any time over who you just sent to us, right? This is a time for teaching priests to rise up. A lot of the times in the fivefold, because we don't have an accurate description of how the body is supposed to work together, which is much like our natural bodies, right? Most people that are dealing with the spirit of infirmity is because something in their body is attacking each other. Most of you dealing with autoimmune deficiencies or that's AIDS, autoimmune disorders or like lupus or things of that nature finds that your, your immune system, if I'm not mistaken, is attacking each other. It's attacking itself. Well, guys, that's what's happening in the body of Christ is that you have these members in the body that's attacking each other because no one knows the proper functioning. And so instead of people saying to the prophet, well, why aren't you teaching either? Shut up, because you don't even be watching my YouTube lives, okay? You should be teaching. It's like I'm doing an alley-oop. I used to be play varsity basketball. It's like I lift up the ball, and you're supposed to take the ball and slam dunk it, right? Even though I'm a prophet teacher. If you are a teaching priest, your job is to take what I said as a warning, and your job is to now take this live, and now craft a teaching with scriptures to the body of Christ. That is how we all work together. Teachers should take this live that I've done as a prophet of God and outline it and then begin to teach and warn the body with scriptures and teach why what God said through me was accurate and what the warnings are. Pastors are now supposed to take this live and protect their sheep because of the warnings that the wolves are knocking at your door. Evangelists are supposed to take this live to the unbelievers and then, because you're the ones that's reaching the harvest first, and protect against the wolves. Apostles are supposed to do whatever y'all supposed to do too. The one question I have for you before I get off of this live today and the one question I want you to ask yourself for the rest of this year is who is on the Lord's side? My name is Prophet Tiffany, and thank you for your time.